Hey guys, this is Sergey. And today I want to show you that you are not stuck with C Sharp 7 if you have to target full framework or .NET Standard 2.0. And you can still use most of the productivity improvements that the C Sharp compiler team added in the past 10 years, even without switching to .NET Core. Let's create an empty console application. But even though we're going to target .NET Framework, I'm not creating this version of console application. I'm creating a cross-platform version and then going to change the target framework instead. And there is a reason for that. Okay, let's see. If we would have created a console application that targets .NET Full Framework directly, that's how the project file would look like. This is so-called legacy style project and it has a lot of drawbacks. For instance, you cannot use a central package management and there are some other issues with the build system. But here's the simplified version of csproj file called the SDK style project. And now we can easily change a target framework from .NET 9 to .NET 4.8, for instance. But if we'll try to build this project, we'll get an error that says that the nullability feature is not enabled in C 7.3 and the nullable types are enabled in the C project file. And indeed, the C -sharp compiler determines a default language version based on your project's target framework. And because we started targeting full framework, the default version switched to C 7.3. And here is a table that shows what's the default language version based on the target framework. And some of the language features do indeed rely on the latest runtime. For instance, you cannot use default interface implementation with full framework. This feature was added in C Sharp 8 and it's only available in .NET 3.1 or later because it requires runtime changes as well. But other features like cross string literals or new pattern matching, they can be used with any target framework because it's just a syntactic sugar done by the compiler. And there is a third category of features when the compiler requires special types to be available during the compilation. And the compiler doesn't care where those types are coming from, from .NET itself, from a NuGet package or from your project. There are quite a bit of features like that, including not nullable types, new interpolated strings, required members, and others. To use all the features available in the current compiler, we can set the lang version to latest. We can also set a specific version like 11, 12, or 13 if we want to fix this and use it across all the code base. And now if we'll compile, we can see that the nullability warning is gone and we can start using some new language features like records. Records are quite useful feature because it supports equality and to-string implementation by default. But instead of making records mutable, we can use another language feature and make them init only. But in this case, we'll get an error that the predefined type is external init is missing. And we can fix this error just by dropping is external init class inside of this compiler services namespace. And now the compilation works. And let's say that we want to use another feature and make one of the property required. And now if we'll compile, we can see that another attribute is missing. And we can fix this the same way. We need to drop another few types inside compiler services namespace. And even though the ID says that everything is okay, we're still getting the compilation error. So sets required members attribute is missing. And that attribute is inside code analysis namespace. And now finally, the compilation succeeds. But this is not a very practical solution. A way better option is to automate this thing. We can definitely rely on some build tricks, but the simpler option is to use an existing library called PolySharp. So PolySharp is essentially like a polyfill that allows you to use all the C -sharp language features regardless of the target framework. And now we can get rid of all the custom types and rely on PolySharp. PolySharp uses source generators to generate all the required types needed by the compiler. And if we're going to use PolySharp in more than one project, we can use a little bit of build magic to make it simpler. So we can define or change directory packages.props. We can specify the package version here. We're managing package version centrally. It means that only this file contains the versions. And now we can even define a property in directory build.props to simplify the adoption of PolySharp in our projects. And then if we want to use the latest version in our project, we just need to set the link version property to the latest one or to a specific version and set enable PolySharp to true. But there is one corner case that you can hit with this approach. Let's say that we have a library that targets .NET Standard 2.0 and a test that targets .NET 8. It, it's quite typical for a library using internals visible to attribute to make sure that the test can access internal members. But here's the problem. Let's try to compile this code. As you can see, we're getting an error that string syntax attribute is defined in two places, in my lib and inside the runtime. And if you think for a moment, it kind of does make sense. By using PolySharp, we embed a bunch of internal types inside of this DLL. And now all of those internal types are visible to the tests. But there is a quite simple solution to this problem. 
instead of targeting just the 10th standard 2.0, our lib should target multiple frameworks. As you can see, now everything compiles just fine. And in this case, the test project will use .NET 8 version, and all the other clients are still going to use .NET standard version. Let's cover some of my most favorite language features that you can use targeting full framework of .NET standard 2.0. The first one is collection expression. Collection initialization been improved multiple times over the years, and the latest version is just amazing. And now you can use a Python-like syntax or a syntax available in many other languages to initialize the collections. And here is another very useful use case for using collection expressions to avoid checking collection for now. Before it was possible, but you need to remember an explicit type and use either an array.empty or a numerable.empty. But the new syntax is just way easier to use. If you ever wrote a unit test to parse a JSON or to parse the source code, you know how painful it might be to escape all these special characters, like curly braces, double quotes and whatnot. And Rust Ring Literals designed to fix this problem. So it starts with three or more double quotes, and in this case you don't need to escape anything but three double quotes. But if you ever needed to use three double quotes in your string literal, you can always add more double quotes in the definition of your string literal. We already had seen that the ID was able to show the JSON in a different format, and this is extensible. For instance, with string syntax attribute we can add additional metadata to our string parameters. So for instance, in this case we can specify that this string parameter is regex, and now the ID can highlight the regex patterns. Another format that we can use is composite format, and this is very similar to console write line. And in this case the ID highlights this as well. Another feature that they use a lot is records. Records were added in C-sharp 8, and later on, the record structs were added. By default, record is a class. It means that it's heap allocated. And record struct is a struct. It means that it's a value type. Records provide some very nice functionality out of the box. For instance, structs do provide equality by default. But the default equality implementation in structs is very inefficient. But for record structs, the equality is implemented by the compiler. And we can easily see how exactly it's implemented. We can use ILViewer for that. As you can see, the location struct implements a equatable interface. And it means that the compiler generates equals and get hash code for us. And unlike the default equals and get hash code for structs, this implementation is very efficient. It also provides some additional functionality, like printing all the members in its toString method. I doubted that you will ever use this feature in practice, but it's fun to know about it. The for each loop in C-sharp language was always extensible. It never actually relied on any interfaces. For the for each loop to work, the compiler was looking for an instance method called getEnumerator. And that method should return a type with current and move next member in it. And that's it. But up until C sharp 9, that method should be an instance method. But now even extension methods will work. So here's a crazy example. So now if we'll create a getEnumerator extension method for int, we can use something like this. And it's going to work. Here is a slightly more practical example. Let's say that we want to create a DSL that we will use ranges in it. And in this case, we can use 1.10 to represent range from 1 to 10, and we can use for each over it. And here's the last feature that I want to show you today. And to be honest, it's one of my favorite. You probably use this feature already if you use .NET Core and use argument null exception throw if null for validating arguments of your methods. But even for full framework, we actually can implement the same behavior ourselves. So here is our throw if null method. It takes a value, and if the value is null, it calls throw argument null exception method. And this method unconditionally throws an exception. This is done to make the throw if null more inline friendly. There are two key attributes used in this method. First, the argument itself is marked with not null attribute. It means that if the method returns, whatever was passed as an argument is not nullable. And we can see this in action. The name local variable is not nullable here. And the second attribute is color argument expression attribute. It tells the compiler to capture the name of the expression that was used to populate this value. In our case, it means that if this method will throw, we'll see request.name in the error message. And let's see this in action. As expected, we had an exception because we passed null there. And the parameter name has an expression that we used in the code to pass it to throw if null argument. C Sharp team spends a lot of time focusing on dev productivity. And you can use most of the latest language features even if you got stuck on full framework or you have a library that targets .NET Standard 2.0. Just use PolySharp and change the language version to the latest or whatever version you want to use and you'll be able to use records, collection expressions, new pattern matching, static lambdas, and many other awesome features. 
And if you want me to cover some specific C-sharp language feature in depth, please drop a comment and I'll cover it in the future. As always, like, subscribe, and share the video with your colleagues. I'll appreciate your support. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.